Uh, welcome back to Bruce's Bees, everybody. I'm um, excited tonight to have a, a guest with us, Larissa from Beekeeping Made Simple. And Larissa is from Hawaii, so it'll be a little bit different tonight. We had uh, the Bush Bee Man on a few weeks ago from Australia, and Larissa's on here from Hawaii, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Larissa, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your beekeeping experience and a little bit about your your personal life, maybe your family, if you'd like to share that with us and just kind of kind of let us know who you are here. Sure. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, actually. I'm very much a city girl <laughs> to heart. I grew up right in downtown Philadelphia and knew nothing about bees or kept any plants or anything of that sort. Um, and then in college, I met a girl from Maine and she exposed me to life with life with plants and life without air conditioning and she made a worm bin for our apartment and um you know it was just like in my 20s really pretty pretty young that she said we should get some beehives my only experience with bees was you know once in a while a bee would fly into my hair um because i have blonde hair so <laughs> sometimes that would happen and um, that was about it, but there was a hydroponics farm in Philadelphia and they had bees and she said that their honey was always sold out. They called it honey from the hood, which I love that, um, that honey label is one of my favorites. And so, um, we tried it and it was the weirdest thing. I'm a pretty laid back person, you know, like I just. I, I dabble in things, I have hobbies, but I've never really had like one thing that I just like really loved and was all about. And then I started reading about bees and I became like borderline obsessed about it. Um, I was probably like the typical hobby beekeeper that when you talk to people about bees, like you get that glazed over look on their eyes because they're just, they don't want to be rude and tell you that they're bored with like you babbling on and on about bees, but I would just like talk about it nonstop. So that was really the start of me in beekeeping. I informed my friend Allie that I built two hives with my dad and had two packages of bees on their way. <laughs> I don't really know if she was actually really going to do it, but I just, I just like went and got them. And uh, a couple of years into having bees in Pennsylvania, I decided to take an internship with a farm in Hawaii through the Woofing um, Exchange, which is a uh, worldwide opportunities on organic farms. Went down to South Point on the Big Island, which is one of the most remote places you can really be in the world. Um, and then got another job working at a farm down the road from there. And I've been keeping bees now for 10 years here in Hawaii. Um, but I started to make the transition from working for a apiary that sold honey to keeping bees myself. I started a like a community for beekeepers here because it's very much commercial. I don't know how much people know about Hawaii beekeeping, but the majority of the world's queen bees are raised. Uh, in Kona, Hawaii, which is on the west side of the Big Island here, because uh, it's just like the perfect climate year-round for, for beekeeping. So some of the largest queen breeders are here. But as far as hobbyists, there's not really much to help people out. And rural mites and small hive beetle, you know, their populations are like out of control here in Hawaii with no frost. If you ever been to a tropical climate, you probably one of the first things you'll notice after the ocean and the palm trees are the size of the cockroaches because <laughs> they're like, you know, gigantic here in Hawaii. Um, and so are the rural mites and the small hive beetles. And so it can, there's a lot of um, problems that come along with that. So I started a, like a beekeeping organization for the West Side at Bee Club and um, started giving classes because people we're really just coming to the meetings, trying to find someone to give a class. And then when I had my son, I couldn't give classes in person. So I started putting them online and it went from the happy keeper, which because I try to see the bright side of things and enjoy beekeeping. So uh, I first used that and then I transitioned it to beekeeping made simple 
fairly early on because I realized that what I did in beekeeping was I just tried to simplify the process of beekeeping. And that's what really I got hung up on early on and why I took that internship was because even though I love beekeeping, I thought I was bad at it. I thought I was like the worst beekeeper. I um, really didn't know what I was doing. Like that was the biggest question I had. I just like, I just don't know, like, what am I supposed to be doing for these bees? <laughs> if you, you open up the hive and I feel like I'm just doing busy work. Like I'm just trying to find things for myself to do. Cause until like you're harvesting honey or it's getting colder out, I'm just like, what, what do you do here for these bees? So that's really the ultimate question that I'm trying to answer and help people with through my online class and YouTube videos is um is just helping people figure out exactly what it means to be a beekeeper and how to do that well that's super important i think a lot of us are kind of trying to do that but just the name of your channel alone uh, indicates your desire to help others so did you not have a mentor initially or how did you pick it up to just try to figure it out on your own did you watch videos or kind of how did you i mean obviously if you didn't know what you're doing like none of us do to start off with and you didn't have a mentor it's probably a little tough at first um tell us a little bit about the beginning of your beekeeping and kind of how that happened and and uh how you were able to stick through the tough times like that and keep going it is it is hard everyone uses that word mentor and i was just like how do you find a mentor like i would go to the bee club meetings and i'm such an introverted person i'm not one mm -hmm. to just like walk up to strangers and be like hey can i follow you around with your beehives and call you and hang out with you even though i don't know you and i was in my 20s and most of the people at the bee club were like twice my age and most of them were men and i just felt like really uncomfortable just going up to a guy that looks like he's my father and just being like hey can i hang out with you you know like sure, <laughs> <who does yeah>. <laughs> so there was that part of it and um i took a class but the guy uh, it was an incredibly helpful class the only thing i really got from it was the name of the farm to contact to buy bees so yeah we didn't make a lot of mistakes and Although it was at the cost of the poor colonies that I had those first few years, it is what has helped me with the students I have now. Because for my online class, I offer, I, I call it mentorship. So whenever you sign up for my class, you can email me, text me, send photos, send videos. We can do a phone call or Zoom or whatever. But most people don't. But I really love it when people actually do take advantage of that because I think that it was so hard to find find that through people. And then with COVID, it's even harder because everyone's meeting on Zoom. But even in person, as an introverted person, it was so hard to find somebody to answer questions. And then I started with top bar hives because I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I actually didn't even buy a smoker or a hive tool. That's how like prepared i was and hive tools are seven dollars i don't really know why i didn't buy a hive tool i used the flathead screwdriver um and a friend of mine was renovating his house and he actually cut out the staircase for who knows why um he like took out the staircase and so i took a bunch of the wood that was scrap wood from this house which was an old church so probably not the wood you should have used in a beehive to begin with but my father and i built two top bar hives and we spent like $30 at the hardware store and built some top bar hives with that. So I especially had a hard time because whenever I have a question about my hives, and then I'll mention I have a top bar, then they would all point to like the one guy at the association that had top bar. And I'll be like, oh, I don't know about top bars. Go talk to that guy. So it was even harder to find information um, through YouTube and stuff because of um, having a top bar and that's why I eventually took that internship in Hawaii I I'm a graphic designer or not so much now but that's what I went to college for and that's what I was doing I had at that point already quit my full-time job and was freelancing as a graphic designer so when I went to Hawaii for six months I brought my laptop and I didn't tell my clients that I was in Hawaii I just woke up at four o'clock in the morning to to talk to them 
before I would go work on the farm. And so that's how I was fortunate enough to be able to just, you know, pick up and go 5,000 miles away um, with a month's notice. And it wasn't until I was at the farm, there was a woman that worked there who took care of the hives and a lot of other things. And um, she just had that same curiosity about bees that I did. And even though she had only been working with the bees for a few years, she knew a lot. You learn fast in Hawaii because it is year-round beekeeping. So you're there's never downtime and it can be exhausting. Um, and so whenever we didn't know something, she like had the same enthusiasm for trying to figure out the problem. Because, you know, when you have a mentor, they don't, I mean, I've been doing this for over 10 years, but I still don't think I know what I'm doing. I don't know if you do. Do you feel like you know no. what you're doing? <clears throat> no, I'm always learning. Always learning. You have to have that attitude that you want to continue to learn. Yeah. So when someone comes to you and you're like, my bees are doing this, one, you're not seeing it. So it can be kind of hard to give advice on what to do. You, But also, you know, you, you have to find a mentor that has the same amount of enthusiasm you do, whether it's mm. or at least the same like kind of way that they look towards beekeeping. Some people, you know, are all about the gadgets. Some people like to keep it simple. Some people just love, are just super curious and love to just like try this or try that or to think about like what it possibly could be. And some people just like to leave them be and see what happens. So um, she had the same kind of outlook on beekeeping that I did. And that was really helpful. And now she's in Virginia. <laughs> I'm in Hawaii um, and she doesn't keep bees anymore. But if finding her was crucial, I don't believe I'd still be a beekeeper if I hadn't met her or found somebody along those lines to help me out. And that's why I wanted to offer like the mentorship to anybody that finds me as long as they're willing to pay me for a little bit. I mean, I have two little kids, so I can't help everybody. But if you can't find that from somebody else locally, then you should be able to find it from someone. Because I, it's so sad the thought of someone loving being a beekeeper, but not being able to feel like they fit in to that community or to that world. It's kind of sad because you want everyone to be able to feel like they can, they can find their little way to fit in there. And that's true. It's a, it is a community and, and you can feel isolated. I think, I think probably the majority of beekeepers after within a couple of years, they're, they're done with it because they just, they feel like they're not good at it. They feel like they're going to fail or they have failed a couple of times and they don't have anyone there to help them through the process. And so you're pretty tenacious to just stick with it like that and to have that determination. I'm kind of like that too. I did have a mentor, but I made all kinds of mistakes and, and uh, my mentor would tell me, don't do this, don't do that. And I do it anyway. And then I learned just to listen to him. And, and he's an old kind of old grizzled uh, guy here locally. He, he doesn't like, he would never want to be on camera or ever be, you know, he just does things his way. And, but he's been real good to me and helped me out through the, you know, through the years. And uh, he got me through the first few years. And now as I've, as I've grown, I kind of, have moved, you know, I kind of, the mentors have kind of shifted and changed. And now I've got a lot of guys, even through the YouTube thing, I've got two or three guys here locally, including my original mentor, a couple of the guys that I talked to here in Alabama locally and some others. Um, but then, you know, of course I'm, I'm kind of hooked in through YouTube to people all over the world, really. And especially kind of all over, all over the United States here. But, um, so you're on the big island of Hawaii, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so that's, I've never been there. I've been to Oahu before, but I've never been to the Big Island or any of the other islands. And so that's pretty cool. It's got to be totally different over there. We are, here in Alabama, we are, you know, we get really hot in the summertime and we get, it's pretty mild. I and mean, when we do have a few, what I would call cold days, but people up north laugh about that. Like you being from Philadelphia, you would probably laugh at what I call a cold day. But, but uh, we do have the seasons here, kind of. What's a cold day for you? Uh, you know, we get down below freezing, like in the upper twenties, you know, right. just a few days a year. And, you know, we're never more than, we're never more than a couple of days from a day in the fifties or sixties, you know, even in the middle of the coldest part of the year at most like three or four days away, it's, it just always warms up enough to where it's tolerable, but we will dip down sometimes for a couple of days to where our highs are maybe in thirties or forties and lows are in the mid to upper twenties. But that's, that's rare. Usually. We have a few nights in the lows in the 20s and then 
you know, usually it's up in the 30s or 40s during the daytime. It never all hardly ever gets colder than that. So, but it's it's just short term, you know. And we'll have these. We'll have these when it yeah. comes to like uh, your bees going through a winter like that, because there's no food for them, but it's warming up to the point that they're weaving their cluster and flying out. And yeah, yeah. It, 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 it could be it could be tricky because yeah, it's um, you know, we have some little false flows. I guess you could call them where, like in January, there's like a little the the maple comes in the red maple comes in just very short for a very for a short period of time and the bees will start to just explode and build up you know in january it'll do that it'll we'll have that little warm-up and the trees will start blooming i don't even know what it is the red maples and some others and then you know the bees will build up and be about ready to explode brooding up and everything and then we'll have a cold snap or we'll have a dearth there for two or three weeks and you got to watch them or they'll they'll go from being pretty heavy to just light like almost overnight and so you got to just watch them really closely yeah. And then, you know, it's just kind of that way through probably early to mid-March and sometimes even later in March if we have a cold snap. And uh, then when you get into April, usually it's pretty good and they, you know, you're pretty safe. But boy, for about, say, January to mid-March, um, you're kind of touch and go here. Uh, a couple of years ago, like last year in 2022, if I'm not mistaken, it, it stayed. We didn't really have a little cold snap in March or April like we do lots of times. This year we did, and it really messed up our flow. And so our honey crop this year is not going to be anything like what it was last year. We've had two or three really good years, but this this year is not very good. And so it just it's just you know Mother Nature. She's going to do things like that to us sometimes. And yeah. is it pretty consistent in Hawaii? Do you have a pretty consistent flow? I know the weather is pretty mild, but does it vary from year to year with the flowers blooming yeah. and so forth? There's definitely like the years that are terrible. There are years when it just we get a ton of rain right before okay. the Christmas berry, which is one of the biggest, it, it is the biggest nectar what, flow. What is, the, what is that? I didn't hear that. What kind of flower? Um, also called the Brazilian peppercorn pepper tree. It has okay. a really tiny little white flower. Fortunately for me, since I do a lot of comb honey, it takes a really long time to crystallize. Really okay. light in flavor, really mild. Um, I think it's also a really big honey in Florida. Okay. Well, it has two seasons in the spring and the summer, late summer, and um, you can lose a lot in, because of the spring rain, which is kind of late in the year. Right now, it's still raining, but usually it's like an April kind of rain. And then, of course, you have the hurricane season that can cause a lot of those flowers in the late summer to um, fall off. I mean, there are some people that have their hives in places where they're just complaining that it's just too much honey. They can't handle it. There's one guy that does queen breeding, and he just complains about how much honey he brings. <laughs> um, is that what you do? You do mostly honey production with your bees? Yeah, my my biggest income producer over the last, since I've been doing bees, has been the honey. I've done a little bit of pollination. I've sold just a very few nukes, not very many at all, and uh, never really sold queens or anything like that. So honey production has been my biggest source of income we have i have sent a few bees out to california for almond pollination this year we just got hammered out there with the weather was awful and we had a bad experience with our broker and so um i probably won't do that this year i'm kind of trying to work on my queen uh lines a little bit the genetics i'm trying to maybe look into doing some queens here in the near future so i'm shifting my focus a little bit i'm i'm what you call a sideline or i've got about i, I stay around between 100 and 130 140 hives um, but but uh, they dropped down. I've lost a few. The the darn hive beetles. <laughs> we were talking. That's one reason I was commenting on your live yesterday because well, I had a couple of uh, dead out slime outs yesterday from the hive beetles, and that down here is pretty bad. We have we have a lot of watermelons and stuff around here, and it's just a hot, humid kind of a tropical climate in the summer, and they are just ridiculous. Stupid. So were these like the smaller hives? that you got slimed out or were these like big ones usually it's the bigger ones that that gets i think what happens is there's three three reasons i think i'll lose the hives get slimed out you know obviously you know that the hive beetles are opportunists like they don't come in and kill the hive it's it's a weaker colony that that they kind of yeah. take over and uh typically i i think i have issues because number one the bees get honey bound during a good flow they'll get honey bound and so there's no room for the queen to lay Mm -hmm. Of course, the population drops right when the honey is at its peak, and that's about the same time the hive beetles peak as well. 
The other second issue I think is varroa mites. You know, the same issue happens. The population goes down. Varroa mites, you know, increase, or you just get an, an infestation if you don't keep the varroa mite levels down, and so the bees get weak and sick, and the high bills take over. And uh, thirdly, is just weak queens. Maybe the queens are getting old or they're failing. And so they don't have the, it's really based on population of bees and, uh, and, and too much space with not enough bees and maybe too much pollen or honey and not enough bees to cover it is what the problem is. And, and some areas are just worse than others. Some of my spots are worse than others. Some of them are just kind of like high beetle magnets and other areas I don't have an issue with them much. And so I think it depends on some of that too. But, um, but yeah, I've gotten better with the mic, mic control. I've done a good job treating. I've, I've actually, try to bring in some genetics to be a little bit more uh, resistant, but I'm also treating. I'm not afraid to treat. I do treat for mites and I, I'm trying to get better with keeping the queens replaced. But, but just one example, the, the two hives I had slimed out yesterday, one of them, you know, when you're going through checking your colonies and they're bringing in the honey and they're all just stacked up with boxes and just full of bees. And then you come up on one that's you stacked up a few weeks earlier and there aren't any bees up in the honey supers and you're like, well, they're, they're probably okay. And you just leave it alone. That's just not the thing you should do because I did that a couple of weeks ago with one of these colonies down there in that particular bee yard and came back and they just didn't have enough bees to cover it. So I should have broken that hive down, maybe moved the honey super over to another hive that was strong and tried to get those bees in a nuke or just, I should have evaluated, investigated what was going on to see if I even had a queen or if it was a weak queen, if the queen was failing. Um, last year, that same colony was a very strong colony, and so uh, I, the queen probably just fizzled out, or they superseded. She didn't get remated. I'm not sure what happened, but man, it's just a nasty thing. And I caught it before it was, you know, full of the full of the larva all underneath the hive, you know, squirming around. I caught it before that. There were a few, but it was slimy, and so it was it was heading that direction. I know, but uh, I don't I don't know if you were how early you came in yesterday when I was talking about the hive beetle in Hawaii. But um, Hawaii was pretty late to get varroa mites. They didn't come until 15 years ago or so, um, before I got there. So I've been here about 10 years. They came 15 or so years ago, maybe 20 max. And then the hive beetle came like a year or two after that. And so um, the owner of the farm I used to work for, he had 4,000. They have 4,000 hives. And, He's a fifth generation beekeeper, so that's from Georgia. Super interesting guy. Um, uh, yeah, he was like your mentor. Like he would tell me not to do things and I wouldn't listen to him and I would do them anyway. <laughs> Cause he would never tell me why. And then I find out the hard way. Oh yeah, okay, well, that's why you don't do this. Uh, he has a honey operation over on the big island and um, they had about 4,000 hives and then the varroa mite came and here in Hawaii they're very strict on what can be brought in. It's hard to get mite treatments brought in so like things with formic acid, uh, oxalic acid that has to come, come by cargo ship. You can't have that flown uh, on a plane. So cargo ships take a while to come here and they have to wait till you know the ship is full so by the time the usda had approved that the mite treatments could come because fortunately you guys on the mainland had figured out what to do for the most part about varroa mites um and we could learn from that but they weren't allowing those treatments to come over here to hawaii and by the time they were the mite populations were just through the roof and then the small hive beetle got here um not long after and just wiped out all of the hives so that guy's 4,000 hive apiary went down to like roughly 800 the university lost all their hives a lot of the queen breeders lost everything the Kona queens was like the biggest breeder um in the united states and one of the biggest in the world and they just were losing a lot and um and so he said that what they finally did was they just really had to get control of their mite, um, their mite levels. That and just, you know, harvesting before the hive beetles took over, like, you know, having just too much on the hives. And they don't have hives. There's a photo. There's a, a photo that the hive was taller than the beekeeper. You know, like they just had supers and supers stacked up on these hives. And, and now they can't do that. You know, it's like they're they're taking them off every every few months um because they can't just allow that but yeah for the hobbyists here it's more so those small hives that um there's just too much honey 
and uh, not enough bees to That's troll. But yeah, I mean, like I'll put a lid off and I'll see like 20 beetles scurrying around under the lid. That does not faze me. It's when I'm walking around the comb, that's the problem. And then of course, uh, since I'm on the west side, it's not too bad. Uh, even high up where it's really wet, it's not too bad. But you go to the east side where the macadamia nut farms are, it's really wet. And there the high beetles are just the volcano area, volcano village and stuff. It's super wet um, and lush and the high, uh, this like paradise. Um, and I had a student ask, she was laying diatomaceous surf on the ground. And I was like, that's a waste of time. <laughs> like we put, we put hives in lava fields. We put them, uh, one farm, they made me put some hives since I was the lightest person on the, um, that worked for the farm, they made me go up and put the hives on, um, like some nukes on the roof of a barn because the roof was metal. They wanted to see if that would do anything. Like, did it work? It didn't work up there. Yeah. No, it didn't work because they fly and yeah. they do have to go to pupate. They leave the hive to pupate in the ground, but that's not the problem. The problem is when they're worms and they're these larvae that are squirming around. That's and right. The, so even if those can't pupate, then you have more hive beetles coming from other people's. Yeah. Um, so at one point, um, honeybees were like a nuisance here in Hawaii. People were, um, the owner of the farm I worked for said that like people hated them. They hated um, the beekeepers coming around and there were just swarms all the time. And now people are a little bit nicer to them um yeah. and not, not as angry towards the beekeepers and, and putting their bees all over the place now that they're the population's a lot lower it's always something with the bees you know when one thing when you kind of figure out one thing it seems like the next thing hits uh, my experience with hive beetles really i came to a head i think my sec my probably my third year of keeping bees um i i had some beautiful colonies at a friend's house just down the street here and um, they were kind of down in the woods a little bit. And my thought process was, I'm just going to let them keep their honey. I didn't know any better because that'll help them be strong going into spring. So they each had like probably at least one to two supers of just beautiful honey on them. And I didn't harvest it or anything. I just let them keep it. And I was going to make some splits and I had it all planned out. I got some queens from a guy up north I was excited about trying. And just my third year keeping bees, I didn't really know a lot, but I was really excited about it. I had some real good success that year otherwise. I, I went down and got them prepped, you know, one day and then got the queens. And it was actually like in August. My birthday is August 6th. I think on my birthday is when I got those queens. And I went down to make the splits. And there were, I think, three colonies right there in that little spot. And I looked up in the tree and it was the biggest swarm you ever saw. <laughs> And the bee, the hive, the hives were just slimed out. The bees were hanging out. You know how they get hanging out on the front. I know you mentioned this in your live chat yesterday about how you think it's a strong colony, but then you open and you realize it's just hive beetles. <laughs> and I had never experienced anything like that. And I was just so bummed. And then I'm like, I got to figure out something to do with these queens. Cause I had like a few queens I had purchased and I had planned on splitting those colonies like two or three ways. And it just, it was a nightmare. But I still don't know when I, I know the larvae are what pupate in the ground or they 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 have to have a stage in the ground when they when they reproduce. And so, you know, when I go out to a, a bee yard and I, I'm just out there doing my bees and all of a sudden I, I pull a box up and and there's like about a half an inch of, of little maggot looking things. You know, I call them maggot. They are maggots to me just squirming around on the bottom. I'm not sure what to do then. I, I don't know. Uh, what to do with all those things i've, I've tried just taking my hive cool and trying to smash them um i put them in a bucket and like dumped them in their lake in the pond and they just they die instantly i almost die immediately in water you can put them on asphalt and they'll die almost immediately yeah, but do. if you're right there in the bee yard i mean you can't what do you do so that is I a question have have bag, contractors trash bags with me just in okay. case so you just put them in the trash bag I mean, have you seen, like, I forgot about one. I put it in a trash bag and they, like, ate the plastic. I think one person that is a beekeeper was working on using small high beetle larva to eat plastic as, like, a way to get rid of the oh world. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. they, are, they are brutal. But the, the best thing to do is to burn them. If you can just burn them, that's the best thing. But the other thing is the frames, you know, when you got these, these frames that are just all slimed out, you know, the comb. Some of us old needs to go bye-bye anyway, but if you got some of those, you know, honey supers full of 
fairly fresh comb or honeycomb that you use from year to year. You know, I don't know. I've washed it. I've, I've sprayed it off. And sometimes like in August, if I've got, if I go to a bee, if I, if I'm out seeing my bees and I have six or eight or 10 dead outs with hive beetles, I just am so fed up with it. I throw them on the burn pile, but that's a, that's a lot of money that's going up in flames. And so yeah. what do you do to process, you kind of eliminate the problem initially by putting them in a bag, but what do you do with the frames and the equipment? Um, like do you, can you spray the equipment down, just wash it with water or how do you get it back so the bees will accept it again? Yeah, I just, um, you know, put it like a, have a nozzle on my hose. That's like a pretty strong, you know, um, one level down from having, you know, like a pressure washer, natural pressure washer and just clean them. I don't like to use plastic frames. I found that the hive beetles, you know, plastic frames have all those little crevices that hive beetles yeah. can out in. So I don't like to use the plastic frames anymore because they go in there. But I do, I mean, I don't know if you move your bees like around for the honey flows or anything but i don't move my hive so i do put oil pans and i don't have um over 100 hives like you so that gets pricey when you have too many but i have the oil pans um which i put canola oil in i don't put diatomaceous or i feel like that stuff gets you know, all. like the, the beetle blasters the little traps I don't, I don't use the beetle blasters. I do put those brawny Dynamax towels. I'll like, like mm -hmm. a whole towel down over the entire, under the mm -hmm. lid, like over all the frames. Um, and I put the oil pan below and I don't put my bees in like the, the super, super wet areas. Uh, the, the area I'm in is a semi-arid desert. The other area that I have them in is considered a desert. And then just a little I have some hives up higher because they bring in more honey, but um, now I'm not so much in the honey production, so I don't put my bees up in those super, super wet areas because that's where they love it. There's... What, what is your main focus? What do you, I mean, no, obviously the, the instruction and the mentorship, but what is your main focus like with your bees? What do you, if you don't do a lot of honey production, what do you do actually with your bees? I, yeah, I mean, I do sell the honey, but I mean, I have like a chest freezer just full of honey. <laughs> That's like a question. Like, what am I supposed to do with all this honey? Yeah, I got you. But I don't like, I'm, I was selling it to the stores here, but we're on an island. So there's like only so much, so many stores I can sell it to without sure. having to then start shipping it off island. And everybody sells honey here. Sure. Um, I was shipping it off and I had a website and that was so much work. I couldn't keep up on it. Um, and that's why like when I do the, some of my live videos, I'm talking about how to make money beekeeping because um, I do keep bees for a hotel and I keep bees for another private residence. And that's the money that they pay me every month to take care of this. They keep the honey, they pay for all the equipment and they just give me money. <laughs> I'm wow. not me is to not have to deal with all of this other stuff all of the um invoicing and like you know making fifty dollars from a sale on the website here and here and then like going to the post office and that just like wears you out so fast and once i had a second child and every time i had to go to the post office it meant two kids in car seats that i had to buckle and unbuckle and then like you know sure. both arms being occupied then I was, I took down the website. Um, so now it is uh, the beekeeping classes and selling, selling nukes. There's not a lot of people that sell bees here on this island. So um, that is actually uh, another um, source of income that I prefer to sell, you know, a $300 nuke versus a $10 jar of honey. Um, and I worked for, uh, a honey packing uh, place because uh, Big Island Bees, it's, I worked for the honey part of the operation. The, her husband's part of the operation had the bees. So it was like two companies, but one was owned by the husband, one was owned by the wife. And so um, once I saw what went into running a honey packing company and the equipment and all of the money that's lost because it got sent here and it the wrong labels on it or this fruit was forgotten or the jars opened up or like whatever happened. I was like, I do not want to do this. I don't, 
you have to get to a certain point that you can even make any money off of it. Um, yeah. And that wasn't what I wanted my life to be. I mean, that's, um, I, I just decided for like a different kind of um, lifestyle for myself personally. And um, it, it's just hard to make money as a beekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it and you're a little different, like you say. Every situation is different around here. There are not a lot of people. I mean, there are a lot of hobbyists or smaller sideline guys in this area. Not very many commercial people right here. The commercial guys don't want to fool with the honey much. They just sell it to the big honey packers, and so yeah. most of, most of them like to just make bees, sell bees, send them off for pollination and things like that. I kind of enjoy the honey. I don't like. I don't enjoy always the process of, of it, but I kind of enjoy going out. I've got several stores here locally that sell it, and and um, I do have a website. Not many people order it on the website. A few do here or there, but uh, last year I think we we had 7,400 pounds of honey, and uh, we're down to the last five gallon bucket right now. So we've sold a lot of honey. Nice. Um, and I don't, you know, it it adds up over time. I do want to get more into the bees, though. To me, that's a no brainer. I've always been a little concerned about the quality of my bees, though. I just want to make sure that I don't sell someone a nuke that's going to either die quickly or that that is just mean and nasty. And some of my bees have been a little, a little feisty over the years. And so those are kind of my two things that I'm, I'm concerned about. And But I'm trying to get some of that honed in and, and see what happens. So kind of I'd like to kind of take, take a few minutes here and talk about there's kind of three topics that I try to go through. The, the main emphasis of this of this particular interview or my playlist slash video podcast, whatever you want to call it, is um, intentional beekeeping. The title of the playlist is intentional beekeeping. And so many people don't know what to do and they try everything and they just kind of are all over the place, especially as a new beekeeper, you're excited. You want to try everything and it's hard to figure out what to do. Whether or not you have a mentor, still it's difficult to know what to do. And so in your mind, uh, Maybe what would you think it, it means to be an intentional beekeeper? It sounds like you do that, but what does that mean to you? For me, intentional beekeeping is, yeah, not just doing something for the sake of doing it because you think you need to do something. It It's having a purpose. Um, yesterday, I went live and I talked about the number one goal for beginner beekeepers because I thought that that was being lost and, and forgotten for a lot of beekeepers. And so it might seem obvious, but your number one goal should be that your bees are alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, for sure. They, they should be alive, right? And and what, what at what expense? Um, maybe there are things you don't want to do just for the sake of keeping them alive. I don't, I don't know, but, um, I personally think that we should be more intentional with what we do and, and do something because you think it's actually going to help it. You know, like what is the role of the beekeeper is something that I'm constantly asking and trying to answer because I don't think that you always need to feed your bees and. I feel like I get a lot of, uh, yeah, 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 okay, from people because I live in Hawaii. And they're like, well, there's flowers year round. So, of course, you don't think you always need to feed your bees. But before you throw food in the hive, do they need it or is there food for them to forage? Um, I, I think people sometimes maybe want to treat their bees like their children or their dog. And so, yeah, their dog gets food and they get water and <laughs> they want attention, but your bees actually don't want to see you. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like you probably. I, I'm sure that there are some people that think their bees love them and they have a great relationship with them or something. But um, for the most part, they want you to leave them alone. They don't want the roof of their house taken off. They want to be left alone and they probably don't need sugar syrup up until July. And um, uh, you have to more so think about like what, what's, what are the bees trying to do and how can I help them with this? Not what do I think they need or what do I think I should give them because that's what I'm used to doing for everything else that I've cared for in my life. But like, 
what are the bees trying to do? Especially when you consider the time of year. Is it springtime? The hive is small and they're trying to build up. Um, summertime? Or like, is it the fall? What, what's going on? And what's going on in my environment? And how can I help them? I had a student, my first class that I ever taught, um, she said, I just want you to tell me what to do. (laughs) She didn't come to all the classes. I made the mistake, my first class, I made it one class a month for six months. (laughs) Uh, People signed signed up, but, you know, people started to, like, not show up after a while. And... And after the third class, she was like, I just want you to tell me what to do. It's like so much if this and that. And like, she's like, I still just don't know what to do. And I was like, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you what to do until you see your bees and you you look at them and you, you have to figure it out. Beekeeping is really hard. It's it's not like almost any anything else other than like having children, I think. <laughs> Um, because you just don't know what you're going to get. Like every hive is different. You could have 10 kids and still your 12th, 11th one will come out and it'll be totally different. And you will be able to do the same thing you did with all that you did with all of your other children. Like, it's just, it's just always different and your environment changes. And, um, the only thing that I think stays the same is that you really have to, to like pay attention to them and be observant and and try your best to do what's what's best for them that's really i mean and that's like the worst answer for most beginner beekeepers is like yeah. not one year um but it, it is important I, I think you actually i think the first video maybe um when i reached out to you the video that i saw of yours that kind of caught my attention was i think the thumbnail says read your frames or read the frames or read the hive or something like that and uh, you did a great job in there explaining what you're seeing, what to look for, you know, what the queen looks like, what each different kind of comb, uh, you know, the pollen, the, everything. It was just a real basic video um, where you went through that. And it was really broken down in a way that anyone who looks at a frame of bees can see what, you know, they can recognize what's going on there. And so I thought that was really good. And then I, I watched a little bit more of your stuff. And that's when, like, I got to reach out to Larissa and uh, see if she wants to come on for the interview because I could tell you're you're really focused on teaching the basic principles of beekeeping and and also helping really be a mentor to people out here who are trying to learn and um, it's like you said though every every colony every hive is different every queen is different even queens that are bred by the same queen breeders have different genetics because they mate with so many different drones and every every personality every hive is going to be just a little bit different that is one thing that can be very agitating about these is the consistency the lack of consistency because you'll have a a double deep or whatever just a great big monster hive and then you know you'll have one that's a mediocre hive and then you'll have one that's uh, just never gets out of a nuke but they survive but they just never grow into this big massive hive and supposedly they all come from the same area the same stock whatever but one of the hardest parts is that that huge monster hive could be the one that just gets like destroyed Precious. because it had so much honey on it and then a dearth comes and it gets robbed out like yeah I, it, it is it is yeah because that it seems like honestly in my situation i i lose you know i'll have these great big colonies that'll that'll make just massive amounts of honey and then they just absolutely crash and you know and some of them just kind of you you, you reduce the space you give them some you know you you treat them right you take care of them and they they just kind of go where you want them they do what you want them to do and they make it through winter and then you can the next year you got you know they continue to survive but some of them and we're coming up on a dangerous time here because the honey flow is just about over it basically is over we're going to harvest next week and then it's just you know really the worst time here is july august and even into September a little bit when it's just so hot and humid and there's really not a lot of a honey flow going on. There's not a lot, there's a lot of bees they've built up. There's nothing for them to do and they can crash so fast. And uh, there's enough usually of a little trickle to come in and kind of keep them alive, but you do have to watch them, but they get real robby. They start trying to rob each other. And uh, you know, when people talk about how bees are so nice and gentle, they are absolutely ruthless in the wild. If they're hungry, they are ruthless, man. They are, they were, it's just kind of funny. It's, 
that people say that because like you mentioned earlier, it's not, they're not pets. They're wild animals and they will, it's an opportunist. They are, it's like all about survival and they will do whatever it takes. If it means destroying that colony down the end of the row, they're going to go in there and they'll take that thing. You know, they'll eat all the honey and they'll kill them to get to that food store if they, if they're able to, if it's a weak colony. So it is kind of interesting. I want to take a few minutes here though, and maybe move into uh, three basic topics. I mentioned this briefly to you beforehand. Uh, there is a movement, it's, it's called the Hive Life Movement. You may have heard of Hive Life. It's a big conference that Cayman Reynolds, uh, one of the bigger YouTubers out there has established. Uh, I think there's been, there have been three of them. And uh, anyway, Cayman's a pretty good beekeeper. He's a really good beekeeper, real basic. He, uh, he created this convention, this, uh, this community out there. And, uh, he, but he has three basic principles that he, he likes to kind of push. And, and it really it does break beekeeping down into a very simple way to think about it. The number one is it's basically great queens, dead mites, and proper nutrition. So if we could just take a couple moments on each topic, what do you do um, to, to make sure that you have great queens in your colonies? How, how do you manage your queen situation with your bees? Oh, yeah, I just now a lot of this is just speculation on my part, but I, I, I'm on an island, so they haven't brought bees onto Hawaii for I don't know how long, probably over 100 years. Um, you're not allowed to ship bees in. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not sure if they ship uh, semen, <laughs> like drone semen in, but, you know, there's a lot of queen breeders here, and as far as I'm aware, they're just breeding for numbers and and nothing else. You know, they're the ones that are sending 30, 40,000 queen bees to some of those pollination companies in Canada and stuff um, so that they're all ready to go to the almond orchards in California come February. So I get really frustrated here with, with the lack of genetics that they have. So for me and what I also just try to push especially the beginners is that especially to start when you're building your like you shouldn't be trying to harvest honey and stuff you should just be trying to build an apiary and get as many like build that genetic pool as much as possible and then when i have um a hive that's doing really well that's a hive that i'm breeding from i make my own queens i don't purchase queens because they don't really trust the genetics of the breeders here um and it's actually despite the fact that there are so many queen breeding operations it's really hard to buy you know like 10 queens or 20 queens you hmm. you're if you're not like buying a thousand then they're like doing you a favor and you're like oh thanks that's interesting <laughs> wow okay we're, we're not paying for shipping but um I did meet a queen breeder at the post office one day, and um, he would sometimes meet me at the parking lot of the grocery store uh, a couple blocks away from where he lived, and he would sell me queens for 20 bucks a piece. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not really being, there's, there's no consideration to almost anything other than the fact that it's a queen and she's laying. So um, I was doing cutouts and catching swarms, but for the most part, it, it cutouts and um, getting bees from everywhere whoever was selling them and just trying to build my um apiary that way and weeding out the ones that were doing poorly and breeding my own queens well that's a, a pretty good way to do it um if you can just kind of assess your situation and obviously breed from the strongest ones the ones that have the traits that you like you know do you actually eliminate queens that are weak uh, do you go ahead and and pinch them or do you you just kind of let them survive and, and eke out an existence until they, they fade yeah. away. No, I mean, I used to, but I've gotten more cold hearted as the yeah. years go by. <laughs> it's yeah. equipment, you know, it's equipment that's being used and I'm usually low on equipment. If I have extra equipment sitting around, then I, I might leave them be for a while, but I'm not going to let them. Yeah. I think the best way to increase the strength of your colonies is to to just eliminate the weak stuff if you can. And I, I spin hard for me because I, like I told you just a while ago about the hive beetles, I'll just I just want to give them a chance. I don't want to dump them out. You know, I could I could have very easily taken that super honey, put it on another strong colony, and condense the space, assess the situation, and either 
uh, just shaking the bees out or, or figured out a queen, some, something to do with them, but I didn't do it. And so I, I still struggle with that a little bit, but just yesterday and today I ordered some, uh, I think they're going to be pretty good queens. I'm going to try them out from a, a guy in Texas. Um, some, you know, the treatment free type stuff. He's been that way for 20 years. I've heard good things about his queens yeah. and I'm not opposed to treating. I do treat, but I, I would like to introduce some BSH type uh, varroa, varroa resistant type bees into my apiary. But um, so I, I basically went through last weekend and I found 20 colonies that were struggling and weak. Either they were mediocre, spotty brood pattern, even some that, that looked decent, but they were last year's queens. I saw the yellow dot on them and they maybe were, weren't quite up to par where I wanted them. And I just went through and found the queens and just replaced them, you know, just did it. And it's hard for me to do that. Um, now, if it's a really weak queen with a really bad brood pattern, but even if it's, I've got to get better about trying to eliminate even queens that don't have, uh, that don't create bees with the traits I like. For example, if they're too mean or feisty, I, I think I've got to start eliminating those and trying to get nicer bees. But here in Alabama, our feral population is very rugged and strong. I think it's, it's uh, they're tough bees, but and they they make honey. They do well. A lot of them do. Obviously, you have some that are duds, but man, a few of them will just staple your socks to your ankles. They're pretty feisty, and so. You no, know, Africanized bees. They have. We don't. They're. As far as I know, there have been no confirmed cases of Africanized bees in Alabama. That doesn't mean there's not some of that, you know, because I think I think around here there are very few purebred bees, if that makes sense. If you, if you get what you say is an Italian or a Carniolan, I still think that they've got they've got some stuff in there that, and it could be a little Africanized here, a little bit of a Caucasian there, a little Italian here, and a little Carniolan, but. You know, I do, I, you know, it's a dark and a beautiful bee. It could be carniolum, but it could have a little bit of Russian in there. You know what I mean? I think there's just a cross because they do. The diversity with bees is so incredibly amazing. I just don't think that in our feral population, we have any quote unquote purebred bees. I think they're around here. Most of the bees are kind of a darker color. They're not, they're not like the black bees, most of them, but they're kind of a darker color. And they're just, you know, they're, some of them are really nice and they're, they're perfectly fine, but some of them are just, Feisty, but they're not. I don't think I've ever seen a truly Africanized bee. I've seen videos of those, and I've never seen anything like that before. But I, you know, I just want to be able to work them and for it to be an enjoyable experience. And so I'm getting better. I've brought in some bees from different people, but see, I can do that. I can just ship them in from wherever. I can, you know, so many queen breeders here in the country, and and I've I've kind of found uh, through the YouTube thing, I've kind of found some people that that I trust and I'm going to, I'm trying to introduce some stuff and I'm trying to get my stock better so I can ultimately maybe, maybe do a little bit of queen breeding here or there. But, but yeah, I like the idea of just keeping the best ones and breeding from that stock. That's kind of what I'm hoping to do as, as time moves on. I built my um, bee operation, just basically catching swarms. I'd buy a few queens here or there, just kind of, but a lot of it was based on just catching swarms out there in the wild. People would call me. And then I know a lot of them superseded or swarmed themselves and created new queens and made it with the feral colony. And I've, I've had, uh, I bought queen cells and put them in. And so the basic foundation of my bee operation is local feral stock. And now I'm trying to introduce some other stuff in there and hopefully have a, a good influence in the area. But, but our bees here are pretty rugged. They're pretty tough. I mean, they, they, you know, some of them never get out of a nuke and some of them just you know, get up into four or five supers of honey. So you just got to figure out what your traits are that you want and go from there. Go My ahead. first week uh, working full time for this commercial apiary um, was November and that's when they requeen. So I just had to go out with them and they would just go to a yard of 100 bees, open up every single hive, find the queen pincher. And then there would be another guy coming around just putting like a queen on the lid and another guy that would just like open the box and throw her in. And they were affiliated. They were started by the same guy that started the queen breeders. So they just got queens for free. And I would just, I was going around with the beekeeper that had been there the longest and I would find the queen and I'll be like, here she is. And he's like, you know, and I'm like, but this hive looks really strong. I don't think like she yeah. needs like, we do this every single queen and like the yeah. next time like <laughs> how about yeah. he let me he let me save one queen one queen in the whole yard he was like okay fine just you didn't save. just stick it in a cage and take them home for yourself <laughs> you know what i did the next day 
I brought a jar of rubbing alcohol and put the dead queen bees in there um, and like tried to make like a queen bee Sorry. essence to see if like I used the pheromones to like equipment of my own at the time and I was living in a studio apartment which used to be the honey house of another queen breeder so I wasn't really I didn't have anything to I couldn't really do much with those queen bees it was I had nightmares about queens well not nightmares but like I had would wake up with dreams of like queens like walking by like the ceiling and the walls and stuff for like days yeah. after killing hundreds of queen bees that week yeah, um, yeah me, things every year it's every November yeah. you just kill them all yeah that would be hard but be, before we move on to the next topic um you know I think something I've noticed and as I've, as I've listened to and learned from, you know, folks like Cayman Reynolds, Bob Benny, um, Greg Burns and others, a young queen is a good queen. I think I, it seems to me like colonies with younger queens in there seem to, to just be more healthy and, and more resistant to some of the diseases and things like that. And so I think there is something to that. I don't, that doesn't mean you have to replace every queen every year, but I do think that those, you know, there's nothing quite like a brand new, vibrant, well-mated queen and how they just kind of, they have a different look about them. I mean, they're just, it's just like young people, I guess, more energetic and they're just so beautiful, really. They really are just beautiful. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, like, they, they do like, they're not fertile uh, a lot faster because they're laying year round. Yeah, 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 for um, sure. It is, like, I, I will still sometimes see, like, you know, a pile of drones outside the hive during a dearth or something, but still, there's never a time when they're, like, never yeah, yeah. laying. Yeah, so, never shut all the way down. Yeah, we, down here in Alabama, we have a little bit of brood. The local stock, most of it, um, and if you have Italians, they never shut it completely down, you know, if they're a strong Italian influence, uh, because it never stays cold long enough for them to do that. You know, some of these Carniolans, or if you have a heavy Caucasian type of influence in them, they'll shut it down pretty good. I mean, it's a real small little cluster and it scares you. You're like, oh my gosh, and then they explode in the spring. But most of the most of the bees down here, there's a little bit of brood in the colony year round, but they don't stay, they don't lay strong throughout the year. Now, some of those Italians will, and it's just, it, it, you get in trouble with starvation then because there's nothing coming in and they're still laying. You know, I say Italians, Italian influence, but most of the bees, don't brood all the way down, but they, there is a definite decrease in the number of pop, the amount of population in the hives. Next topic would be um, dead mites. What do you do to control your mites? You mentioned earlier that you had a hard time for a few years getting the treatments over there. Do you do you have all the different treatments now? The different the, the Apivar, the um, Formic Pro, all the different things now. Are there still some things that you lack, or what do you do to control the mites in your bee population? Um. I don't know. So I go to the apiary that I used to work for. They buy them um, by pallet load. And okay. so I'll buy like a bucket or so from them for the formic um, because they are organic. I don't know who certifies them. It's not the USDA, but someone certifies them organic. So they're only using the um, organic okay. treatment. And I, at this point, usually just have to treat once a year in January ish before the honey flow starts again in february and then i just keep tabs like just do some mic my, my tests every month or so to make sure it's not getting too bad and since the honey flow is so long um you know it's like february you're getting the golden rod and the mac nuts and then you have a little bit of a downtime but not enough to put a treatment in before the next honey flow starts so Worst case scenario, I'm always also putting a treatment in in September, or October, if needed. And then year to year, I just try to rotate out the treatments. I haven't gone with the oxalic acid in a while since the last time I used a vaporizer. And, and one beekeeper was saying that the it doesn't work well with the humidity here, um, that oxalic acid and all the brood present. It's kind of exhausting to go to all your hives and have to do that uh, month week after week but i try to you know, not use the um apple bar it doesn't seem to be too effective and i really don't like the amitraz it freaks me out a little bit yeah. um, especially as someone who i had two kids in the last two years and nursing it made me like especially i, mean, I didn't like the fact that 
I felt like being a beekeeper was exposing me to things that were harmful to myself or my child. I mean, that seems so sad that, you know, you're supposed to be doing something that's outside and with nature and all of a sudden you're like exposing yourself to chemicals in order to do that. And yeah. I feel like that's one reason why some beekeepers like to be treatment free. So personally, my goal is to do what I can to use treatments as little as possible. I don't think I'm ever going to find a hive with genetics to deal with for all mites. You know, like I had talked with Randy Oliver when I had a podcast about his bees that were, he was, he had a decent amount of hives that were dealing with mites naturally on their own. And I don't, I, I think this, the genetics here are too limited for me to ever be able to find that. I'm, I mean, I still test to see if it naturally will happen. But I do do not use foundation, and so my bees do make their cell sizes whatever they want it to be. Um, and if the white levels are getting high, I will cut out the drone cells um, when I find them, and we'll put a treatment in. And that usually is enough. I'm constantly also moving my bees because because of all of the commercial apiaries here, and a lot of the commercial apiaries are on the side of the island that I live on. Your bees will do great and they'll be in this like magic little pocket where they find food and they're far enough away from commercial apiaries. And then you just know when someone puts a yard of bees, 50 or 100 hives near you because they just explode with mites and hive beetles. And it's mm. like someone just took like a dump truck of them and just like dumped them on the property or something. And so that's when I'm then putting a treatment in pretty fast and I'm trying to find an, a new yard for them. I don't, I mean, it's, Hawaii, it's expensive here. <laughs> All yeah. of those you hear about it being expensive in Hawaii or for the most part, but true. We have a small home on a, like a quarter acre or so here. None of my bees are on my property. It's not ag land. So I'm always finding uh, land on other people's property to put them on. And so that's really like the hardest part for beekeeping for me personally is finding a place to put my bees. And that seems to be like what most people take for granted is they'll just throw them in their backyard and everything will be fine. And I really try to tell people to find backups before they do that. Yeah. Uh, unless they have neighbors that are far, far away. Um, that's really the hardest part for me is like, how close am I to a commercial apiary and other bees? Um, that will really like determine whether I need to treat um, more often or not. I'm not against treating. I do try to use organic treatments but I just really like rotate them out. Um, Apigard isn't considered organic in the U.S., but I believe it is in Europe. That one is definitely like the easiest personally I found to put them in as long as it doesn't get too hot out where the bees are. I'm not a fan of the formic. <laughs> I, I am limited to like the formic acid that I use because it is hard to bring it in. So I use what the other beekeepers use and just buy it from them. So I don't really know what other formic acid options there are for administering it, but the ones that I've used are are, are pretty harsh on the queens, in, in my opinion. And it also is, gets so hot, it, it can cause them to abscond and go queenless and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I started trying formic pro for the first time this year, and as long as it's in the right temperatures, it, it seemed to work pretty well. I've been afraid to do it, but it, you know, I did it when the temperatures were within reason, within the you know specifications of the product and the treatment and so yeah it's a little harsh on them for you know two or three days the formic pro is but then they seem to kind of bounce back with a vengeance and i, I did i think maybe have some queens that superseded or maybe didn't didn't get through it but they were i think were some of my weaker queens anyway so they probably needed to go anyway but yeah, I what i found a lot of the some of my colleagues were weak and they had a spotty breed pattern and i used the formic and it just shuts down that laying for for a few days but man when some of those queens start laying again it's like a perfect brood pattern it's kind of strange how they just it straighten them out but it is harsh on them and it, it is a very um powerful treatment i think and you got to just make sure you're careful and and use it properly but i don't know it's tough it, it's the thing that we're all trying to figure out i, I talked to the bush bee man a, a few weeks ago from uh australia and, they're just they haven't yeah. had the real mice and they're just coming i guess on i can't remember which side of the island of australia 
uh, the Varroa mice are, but they're, he lives in kind of an isolated area, uh -huh. but they're headed his way. They, he lives in the area where the almonds are in Australia, so people bring bees from outside to his area. Oh, so they're, so, gonna be yeah, so they're going to be bringing them in there. And so he's real worried about them because they haven't experienced that before. And they've had the hive beetles, but he's kind of in a desert area. And so it hasn't been too bad. They really just don't know what to expect. He's real nervous about it. But kind of moving on to the next thing, you've discussed a little bit about this already. Nutrition, uh, proper nutrition is the third of the three-tiered approach that, that came and talks about that I kind of have you know, prescribed to. Uh, what do you do for nutrition? I, I personally kind of, I do feed, but as needed, I don't feed my bees all the time. I feel like if they've got plenty of weight and or if they're bringing stuff in, I don't need to feed. And also it's just a financial thing. I mean, if you feed your bees, I probably don't feed mine enough, but my gosh, you just, are you going to make any money with your bees if you feed them constantly? And so, of course, my main income has been the honey. Uh, if I actually sell bees and you're trying to make bees like crazy, then you need to feed them to stimulate them to grow and to make more bees. But I haven't, that hasn't been my emphasis in the past. But what's your, what is your philosophy on uh, nutrition, proper nutrition for your bees? I, I agree with you. I can't, I, I can't run my apiary as a commercial apiary. I'm never going to be a wealthy beekeeper. <laughs> yeah. or my wealth is not going to be, not going to come from beekeeping because I've seen how the, queen breeders operate and it like makes me want to cry i just can't i can't i can't do that i can't treat bees uh, like they're um object or you know like just stock but like you know I, i'm in hawaii there is flowers year round there is a time when there can be really dry and there's not much blooming or super rainy like i've experienced a dearth but it's not too bad and when I worked for Big Island Bees, they were organic and part of the certification was they are not allowed to feed their bees whatsoever. So that's how I, I learned was through no feeding at all. I stay away from pollen patties at all costs because that's actually how I've had some, some slimy hives is because I found that the beetles like to hide their eggs or the larvae swarm around under those things. And now, I mean, I will feed bees if I need to. I'll feed like nukes and stuff or a hive that is struggling just to see like it can help to see what its problem is, is by feeding it. But for the most part, if I need to feed my bees, that's a sign that I need to move them. And so then that's when I start looking for new places for them. Okay. Now there's the hotel that I have the beehives on. That's a place I've always struggled with because it is on the on the water and so the bees love the palm trees and there's kiave which is um uh, i forget what the word is the word is for it um that's the hawaiian word for the tree it has like these real big thorns on it and the bees love that honey it, it's really light it crystallizes really fast it's delicious honey but it's like the season is you know spring and summer and then the rest of the year is not much food for them and so i do sometimes have to feed those hives too but i also just try not to take too much honey from them because it is for the hotel so it's not for commercial purposes so they're not you know like expecting a certain amount of food um sure. or, or honey you know like they're they're happy with whatever they get um so I'll leave extra honey. I also have a chest freezer, so I use that all the time. Um, I will take like an extra box of honey off the hive that I will not harvest and I will just freeze it and I'll give it back to them throughout the year um, instead of feeding them syrup. And that's not a way to run a commercial apiary, you know, um, but that's a good way to keep the hive healthy if you aren't concerned with how much money you're making like they're paying me the same amount month to month no matter how much honey is coming in sure. and so yeah. for me my goal with theirs those hives are for them to be as healthy as possible and then yeah. when the honey the flowers start blooming then this other apiary that harvests that honey comes in and then there's like an enormous amount of bees everywhere <laughs> And that's when the rural lights and the small hive beetle come for like four months and then they're all gone and it's all quiet again. Um, so my chest freezer is like my best friend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. And I think one thing that we that I've seen and what you've said is is just that obviously we know that beekeeping is very regional. 
And so obviously it's different in Hawaii than it is here, and it's different here than it is in Canada. So it's just different everywhere. So kind of, we may start wrapping this up a little bit here, but I do have a couple of quick questions here. Um, kind of going back to your channel. Once again, everyone uh, who's watching this video, Larissa's channel is called Beekeeping Made Simple and uh, really good stuff. I'd encourage you to go check it out and to, you know, if you like what you see, subscribe to it, uh, comment, ask for questions, maybe even sign up for some of your classes if you're kind of a new beekeeper, if you have anything you'd like, you know, feel like you need to know, because I know Larissa, you do try to keep it simple for people and you try to help them uh, figure out how to get started and keep their bees alive. And, and I think we've, we've established tonight that even the two of us are way different in what we're doing. You know, you, you are not, you don't want to run your commer you know, commercial operation. I'm, I guess, a sideliner. I do it as a business, but I also love the bees. I'm kind of right there in that intermediate spot. But then I do know commercial beekeepers as well as do you, because that's how they feed their families is with their bees. And so everybody, you know, that, and you've got every, every level within each of those uh, categories you've got someone that's got one or two hives in the yard and then you've got someone who have ten thousand colonies you got every combination in between and so i think it's important for all of us to decide what we want to do and 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 also respect what other people want to do with their bees that's one thing i try to i try to do is you know if someone down the street or or across the state doesn't want to do them the way i do them that's okay as long as they're not doing totally crazy things they can try and do whatever they want you know as long as it's not just too crazy so uh, a lot of people probably think some of the things i do are crazy so i gotta be careful with that one but kind of to wrap it up uh tell us a little bit more about your channel uh, a little bit about what beekeeping made simple means and then i'd like you to kind of address a little bit how you know you're in hawaii now you started beekeeping in pennsylvania so obviously you're on you're you have an online presence through your channel and through your courses how do you kind of deal with people who are going through uh, situations in different parts of the world? Because literally you're probably getting questions where you may have people taking classes from other countries, from maybe the UK or Australia, or I'm guessing the most of your people that do it online, I guess a lot of them are here in the continental kind of United States. So how do you keep beekeeping simple for people all over the world? And how do you manage their questions uh, when they're, when it's, you know, so many different situations they might be in? Well, my, my channel, Beekeeping Made Simple, is really just came from me feeling overwhelmed <laughs> whenever I go to a beekeeping club meeting or go to some, some YouTube channels or websites. And then I having to remind myself, hey, I've actually been doing this for like 15 years. And I started out with two hives I got for free and then I built it to 30 and my aid made my own equipment and I haven't lost a hive in three years like maybe I know what I'm doing like I have to give myself a pep talk sometimes yeah, absolutely <laughs> and, for sure and that made me then want to simplify this process because if it makes sense to me when I am by myself out in the hives, I want to be able to explain it so that it makes sense to other people when they are out at the hives by themselves. And I am always just thinking about what what I went through and wanting to simplify the process and answer those questions that I had that I was having trouble finding the answers for. So I think that there's a ton of great YouTube channels about beekeeping. And I didn't start one for a long time, even though people told me to, because I thought there wasn't a need for another beekeeper on YouTube. Like how many, how many beekeeping videos could the world possibly need? There's not that many beekeepers, but I just wanted to um, put the information in a way that made, that was just simple, like the how to read a frame, which I actually made that video years ago and just sat on it. I even edited it and then I didn't put it up because I thought it was too long and it was bad lighting and it was cloudy. And then I just put it up and then all of a sudden it was really popular and people found it helpful. And then I just realized I need to just go with my gut. And when I started out, I had no idea what I was looking at and what I was doing. And you just kind of like crossed your fingers and closed it up and hoped for the best the next week. And I wanted to help those people that are, were in that same situation I was in. Um, so yeah, now most of my students are in the United States, but definitely have students in Australia and the UK and Poland and and all over the place 
And I worked with beekeepers that were in Massachusetts and Maine when they came to developing the class so that I had people that were had more experience than me in the colder weather climates. Um, and then when it comes to answering questions, for the most part, everyone's questions are still the same no matter where they are in the world, especially this time of year, in springtime, unless you're in Australia because then it's the opposite time of year for you. But for the most part, everyone's still starting out and having the same questions. It's like everyone still is struggling with the same thing, which is like queen problems, actually. Um, a lot of it is queen problems. And a lot of it's just like, am I doing it okay? Like they just want that verification that they're not messing it up. And that's really mostly what I'm here for. Because still people are like, even though I tell people to contact me if they have questions, they'll still do all of this Googling before they contact me. And then they'll come to me with like three possible things that they could do. And they're like, so what do you think? I do have people fill out like a questionnaire when they first sign up for the class so that I know before I'm answering their question um, what their climate is and where they live and what their experience is with bees. So that I'm not asking those like startup questions every single time we have a conversation. I really haven't found that beekeeping varies that that much. I mean, the Big Island has 10 of the world's 13 climate zones on it. Um, so I'll drive to Waikoloa, 45 minutes north of here, and it's a desert. And then you can go over to Nalalehu, an hour, hour and a half away, and it's, you know, like tropical rainforest. Um, I don't have any bees on Mount Ikea, which is where there's snow. But it's quite a, a range we have here that I've seen. So um, I'm actually dealing with different climate zones every time I go out with the bees. That's you know, cool, like, yeah. okay, I'm from the desert, okay, let's go to the rainforest. And it's like, okay, now let's go home. I'm hungry for dinner. So it's, it's, I think it's fun. And I've also noticed that it doesn't really vary that much. Um, it's still pretty much the same, same problems. Yeah, I think it, I think the basics you know, are the same and, and, uh, you got a queen, you know, you got workers, you got drones and they, you know, they mate, drones mate with the queens and, and certain conditions have to exist. What amazes me, one thing that absolutely amazes me is that, you know, you got to be in Russia that makes honey and it still has the same makeup. It still has the same moisture content when they cap, they know when to cap it. They know how to process it entirely different races of bees or, or breeds of bees can ju they just make it the same and it just blows me away they really are amazing little critters and so uh, the bee basics are the same and uh but it does vary from climate to climate you, you know obviously people manage them differently according to their goals and uh it's just a just such a neat i guess a neat thing to be involved with and so i really applaud what you're doing i would encourage anyone out there who is watching this video and who watches the channel to go check Larissa's channel out, uh, Beekeeping Made Simple. Larissa, you do a good job on there. And, and uh, yeah, just keep hitting record because you're doing a great job and you're, you're really sharing some good knowledge with people. And uh, I think one thing that you're pretty good at is just encouraging folks to just keep going and uh, getting a good foundation. And once they get that good foundation, they can take it where they want. You know, if they want to stay the hobby beekeeper, if they want to just have a few hives in the backyard, or if they want to grow it into something bigger they can they can take the foundation that they learned from you as their mentor so to speak that's really what you're doing is being a mentor that you didn't have uh to other people and then they can take that knowledge that's kind of what i've done is is learn from my mentor and now i've learned from others and i've kind of taken a different direction but you give them that foundation that base and that confidence i hear i hear you talking about the confidence is a big thing you want people to have help them have that confidence that hey it's okay to do it this way you're doing things right or maybe try it this way but you're on the right track and so that is something you're really good at as well, is just giving people that confidence to keep going because so many people do quit. So I appreciate you coming on uh, today. Yeah. And uh, from all the way over there in Hawaii, it's pretty cool how we can just get on and, and be live from yeah. entirely different parts of the world. It is just a neat thing. You know, and, I just uh, really quick wanted to mention um, what you said. I like to call it the beekeeper's intuition. And I really try to encourage people to develop that. Um, Every, like everyone right. and to trust it because mm -hmm. there's a lot of beekeeping that's not that's just you're not going to figure out what to do from a book or from a youtube channel a lot that's of right. it's going to be you're the one looking in the hive 
And I encourage people to just like sit outside their beehive. It's what I did my first year. I had just bought a mandolin and I would sit after work um, at the sun, like around sunset and the bees would be coming back. And sometimes they fly into your head or your whatever, and then they keep going. But just like watch them coming and going, you don't even need to open up a hive. Just like mm -hmm. observe, just observe and sit and enjoy their company. And um, just once you start to get to know their patterns and their sounds and the buzzing that they make, you start to really develop this intuition that I think people need to have that confidence to trust. Absolutely. And, and it, the, your skill set gets better. The more, experience mm -hmm. is the best teacher, both yeah. your successes and your failures. I think people become paralyzed with the fear of failing. Yeah. But you can be you can even be the best beekeeper in the world. You might lose a colony here or there. It's going to happen. It probably will happen. And uh, but you learn through that. If you have that attitude that I'm going to learn from my successes and my failures, then you can be successful. But I think you just hit the nail on the head. You've got to get in your bees. You've got to observe the bees and then you've got to try things and see how they react. I feel like most beekeepers, you know, if they understand basic bee principles, They'll run stuff by me sometimes. I'm like, well, try it and see what happens. It makes sense to me, but try it. And uh, I do that kind of stuff all the time. I'm like, well, you know, this makes sense. So I'll try it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, that's I know. Because you know, otherwise, 10, 15 years later, like, wouldn't you get bored with it if there yeah. wasn't something new to keep trying? That's right. But just people, you know, people get so paralyzed and frustrated and discouraged. But you just, well, just got to keep going. What's you know, up? Feel, you know what? You know, not a dead hive's life, like on, you know, on your hands. You don't want to be responsible for yeah, yeah. an animal dying, but you know, roughly one in every three hives isn't going to survive on its own in nature. That's right. In nature, so you yeah. can't like hold it against yourself that you're not perfect, and That's right. you can't expect to be better better than Mother Nature anyway. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, we've gone on here for quite a while. It's been a great uh, chat. I could, you know, I could talk bees all night. But uh, once again, I encourage everyone to go to Larissa's channel, Beekeeping Made Simple. Check it out. And I think you'll really like the information there. There's some great stuff there. And uh, just some just basic information that can help you. And uh, it's good for anyone, but especially if you're a new beekeeper and you're, you're struggling through some things right now. Larissa does a great job. And uh, I appreciate you coming on with me today. It's been really fun. And uh, talking with uh, me, for reaching out. I need to go back and watch some more of your videos. I, I've watched just a few. I need to go watch more because you, you do a great job. And, and like I say, the it's interesting the the video about how to read a frame. I actually had done one of these interviews like this with Ian Stuff for the Canadian Beekeepers blog. He had talked about reading the frames. You got to learn how to read the frames and so i was like well i need to do a video on that and then i saw i saw your video i'm like well there it is right there so i may do something similar but if i do i'll make sure and give you credit that you have a video out there too so you can go and watch your video as well everything's been done in some way i guess by somebody yeah, yeah that's true that's true and everybody has their own take on it and and so that's another thing is there's a lot of us out here trying to do different things and you'll say something or i'll say something that just kind of helps someone it flips the switch mm -hmm. when they understand a little better and that's kind of what i'm trying to do is just uh, really I, I don't do a lot of how-to videos um i do more of kind of like the experience of beekeeping i i try different things here on the channel just like i'll say okay here's this hive and i think i'm gonna try and split it for a way so let's see what happens and so i do a lot of that kind of stuff a lot of trial and error stuff on my channel and just do some fun stuff too uh, but I, I, I really prefer, I like to just help share the experience with folks and, and throw ideas out there and try them and see what happens. And, and along the way, there are some bee basics there, but you know, there's a guy named Mike, named Mike Berry over here that also has a channel down in Louisiana. And he says, it's not a how to video, it's a how I do video. And that's <laughs> kind of how I do it. And, um, but, but I love folks like you, you know, you're, you're breaking it down to the, the basics of beekeeping and giving people confidence and following up and helping them feel you know, good about what they're doing and, and helping kind of steer them in a direction so they'll have success. And that's really what, what it's all about in this YouTube thing. So Larissa, I'm going to let you go. I appreciate your time and uh, folks tune into our channel, Be Keeping Make Simple. And uh, once again, I appreciate you. Uh, thanks. And, and we'll sign off. Okay, Y'all take care. Y'all take care and we'll catch you on the next one. <laughs> you too.